call the meeting of the Board of Regents of Del Mar College to order at 1 p.m. It is Tuesday, October 8th. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here today. We do have a quorum and can conduct business. Dr. Sherwood, would you please lead us? Oh, before we do that, let's have our moment of silence. I am reading, reading out of order here. Moment of silence, please. Thank you. Dr. Sherwood, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Would you please join me as we read together the Del Mar College vision statement? Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Del Mar College is streaming live audio and video from our official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed, statute, as closed session by statute. Uh, as we start off today, I would like to uh, thank the staff and uh, for the, those folks who are wearing pink uh, in, in a Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, go pink. Uh, thank you all very much for that. And we're going to begin today with staff reports, uh, hearing our Cleary statistics. Dr. Escamilla? Uh, Dr. Lewis and Ms. Lauren White will lead this conversation, but Regents and, and to the greater community, every year uh, at this month, we are... Uh, we present the college's statistics um, for, um, as, as per the Clary Act, which is a federal responsibility. And um, this is the time of the year that we, we, we demonstrate to the college um, where our, our challenges still are, but overall, um, how safe a campus that we keep and how fortunate we are for that. And that's not an accident. But that being said, uh, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. So I'll give you a little bit of background and reminder about the Jeannie Cleary Disclosure of Campus Security Policy and Campus Crime Statistics Act, or what's called the Cleary Act. It's a federal mandate requiring all institutions of higher education that participate in the federal student financial aid program to make known crimes occurring on their campus and in the surrounding community. The Clery Act is enforced by the U.S. Department of Education and institutions that fail to comply are penalized with hefty fines and may be suspended from participating in federal financial aid programs. To be in full compliance, Del Mar College must do three things. First, publish and distribute the annual security and safety report to current students, pr prospective students, and employees by October 1st of each year. You have that document in your uh, board packet and we have uh, separate documents. The report must include crime statistics for the past three years, campus policies about safety and security measures, campus crime prevention programs, and list procedures to be followed in the investigation of alleged sex offenses. The second thing is to provide students and employees with timely warnings of crimes that represent a threat to their safety. And third, DMC security must keep and make available a crime log of all crimes reported to them in the past 60 days. The full report is, as I said, in your board packet, but it's also available to the public on the college's website. Ms. White is going to talk about um, any of the crime statistics that you see in front of you. So in the booklet, um, which I want to uh, do a few thank yous, I want to thank College Relations for their assistance. I also want to thank IT for their assistance and making sure that we had it on our web page um, in compliance with the Clery Act. And I also want to thank um, those uh, who contributed to it, the Dean of Students Office, um, College Relations, uh, and also Environmental Health and Safety, and of course Security. As you can see, our statistics show that um, in comparison, of course, to other years, that we are doing very well. Um, nothing um, astronomical or necessarily outstanding in the actual numbers, either on the east or west campus. Um, you will note that there are a few things on the northwest center, but uh, see that at the top that happened on non-campus property, and those were tied into the hospital. 
um, that's out on that property. Um, the rest of it, of course, is for you to look at. Um, I did want to also give you a little update on where we are in regards to the police department. Our needs assessment has been drafted and is in the final process of approval. Um, the funding source, of course, was um, issued by you all uh, through the board action. Um, our physical resources that we have to have available to police officers have been identified and budgeted um, for this upcoming year. Uh, the actual physical location, everything is pretty well complete except for the completion of our operations center where the video cameras and the um, uh, computers will be going and we're working on that uh, closely with IT. Um, the general rules manual is um, under draft. Uh, the proposed administrative structure uh, that is also required by TCOL is, uh, has been proposed. Um, Something that was new recently is the TCOL recommendations about um, our 911. And so we are in the process of establishing a working relationship with uh, Metrocom, which is the regional 911, and also with Nueces County um, for housing of uh, prisoners if that need be. Um, and then the final thing that we're in the process of doing is I have also contacted CCPD because TCOL requires a background check on your chief of police. And I, surprisingly enough, they won't let me do my own. <laughs> so <laughs> CCPD has agreed to um, assist us with that. Good. With a, I'm sorry, I was gonna let you know, we hope to have all the paperwork turned into the state within the next couple of months, and then hopefully a licensing agreement with them um, in the first part of 2020. So, Lauren, just to be clear, if there is any need for detention of, of an individual, um, it sounds like that the place to hold a, a person would be with the with the county at the county jail. So. <clears throat> In what we're proposing to do to start off with, um, it would be as long as we have CCPD officers also assisting yes. um, Delmar College Police Department, um, we would be able to utilize the um, city's okay. detention facility. Okay, the city's detention. But if there were no CCPD officers on duty at the time an arrest were made, then we have to have an agreement with the county, and that would be the normal place to take them to. So you anticipate both of those agreements in place by the end of the year? Hope to have. Hope to have them in place. Right. That's what we're um, aiming for. Any questions on the Clery Act information, Ms. Estrada? Uh, yes. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm very proud of our Del Mar students. Let me turn this thing off. I'm sorry. Um, we had hardly any violations, but I do have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, why are we listing violations under non-campus off-campus why are we counting this against Del Mar if something happened off-campus why are they being listed like if you look at the let's say under 2018 non-campus property mm -hmm. there's two right what does that mean that they didn't happen on campus right so for example like the airport the airport we have just a certain section that were there, but because of the way the Cleary Law is written, um, we have to account certain things. Um, so for example, the Cleary section is, I have to account everything that occurred on this campus, anything that happens in the street, and I have to include the sidewalk across the street. Okay. So the sidewalk across the street isn't ours. Correct. But if a crime occurred over there, that's non-campus property, but it has to be in our stats so that they have an, a good understanding of not just what happens on campus, but what's happening in our area. That was the concern that I had. Okay. And let me ask you another question. Uh, and those, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but those stats okay. do come from the Corpus Christi Police Department. Okay. That's where I get those from. Okay. Okay. Um, I noticed, or maybe I just missed it, that we don't have any guns on campus by non-licensed holders. Do, do, you know, going back to the campus, scary. Have we had any problems with that? Kids bringing guns to school without, no? No, ma'am. We've had, um, the only um, call that I can read, call that was recent, 
Um, we had one person on campus um, that we did approach and we found out that he was actually law enforcement attending a class in plain clothes. Or licensed to carry. And he was licensed, yes. Because he is law enforcement, he's licensed to carry. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Like that situation that happened across the street at the garage with the two kids. I'm trying to turn it on. That middle button, there you go. Okay. The, uh, the situation with the kids that took the car and they ran and yeah. like, uh, mm -hmm. they were there in that building for a while and the police cordoned off everything. Thank you. And the police cordoned off the area. Would that be included in this report? Have to be inclu included? So nearby the, and Delmar was mentioned several times. <laughs> right. So the um, interesting thing in reference to that is, as you can see, we don't report all crimes that occur. We report certain crimes that occur. And the actual crime that those students were accused of was an aggravated robbery. Well, 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 were they students? Um, not students. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, just uh, sure. Hold on. Hold juveniles. on. Juveniles. I think they're students somewhere. They but may have been not students here. somewhere, but not maybe, here. Okay. My, okay. Yes. Well, yes. Let's not, let's not take all the. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, but the ones that those um, young individuals were involved in was a robbery that occurred not within our reporting district. The fact that they happened to run into a building that would technically be across the street. But according to what Cleary says, as I only have to count the sidewalk. So they were in the building, so that would not be. Plus, them running to that location isn't one of our reportable crimes. And we don't have to report either when the media announces something happened and it was a former Del Mar student or mm -hmm. anything like that. Right, if it didn't happen on campus, um, and I believe, um, I mean, we've had several, um, but it didn't occur on our campus and therefore it's not, um, the only time I would say that there's an issue there, um, and this also comes into it, um, is if they're on a school sponsored trip and something happens, then those numbers have to be in there, mm -hmm. even though they didn't happen on our property, mm -hmm. but it was a school sponsored trip. Like when they go to, um, Austin, if something were to happen that's a reportable crime, then I would have to put those in there. But they would fall under one of those other categories, either public property or non-campus property. Okay, thank you, makes sense. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much for yes, the slide. Thank you. Thank you for the update as well. Okay. Uh, next, we will hear a staff report on our enrollment update. Regents, as, as we do on a regular basis, for the past several years, uh, we're going to give you an enrollment update. This is a relatively uh, short uh, enrollment update for a couple of reasons. One, we're not in a, in a funding cycle, but we do, we certainly do watch our trends because there are revenues associated with the enrollment and so forth. But this is a snapshot a, of, of the of the activities occurring uh, that affect the fall semester. That being said, uh, Dr. Silva is going to. Uh, describe it in more detail, but again, by no means is this the exhaustive uh, report that we typically give you, and that usually comes um, every other year, but um, again, this is our uh, annual October fall report. Thank you, Dr. Escamilla. Uh, Madam Chair and Board of Regents, uh, like Dr. Escamilla said, we're not going to go take a deep dive on this one because it's not based here, but we'll talk about trends. As you will see for fall 2019, our preliminary numbers is 12,205. Uh, just as a note, you will see uh, a notation in the bottom left. Uh, our all-time record high is 12,236. That occurred in the fall 2010. So you will see for the last two years, we've been flirting with that number, um, just underneath that number. Uh, also, like Dr. Smith said, trends, if you look at this trend, you would see from fall 2015 to fall 2019, a steady increase in the last five years except for 2017, as we all know, that was the year of Hurricane Harvey. Um, so that, that is our count for right now. We're gonna be enrolling for the spring semester November 4th, so it's right around the corner as well. Um, and starting on the flex for our spring semester, our 15 weeks and second eight weeks, that will be base here. So we'll be uh, uh, looking into those numbers already. So we're already getting ready for, for that. Um, there are uh, two groups that we like to report traditionally in our enrollment reports, and that's our VIP and dual credit. In our VIP this year, you'll see that we have 182 students. 
Uh, for those of you who attended the uh, State of the University address last week with Dr. Quitania, she actually had this graph up uh, on her presentation as well. Uh, both institutions are very uh, happy and supportive of this program. We expect this program to, to grow. We are in constant communications with the university as well. And so it's one of these uh, programs that really benefits both institutions. Again, just real quick, Dr. Silva, on that one, remember those, uh, of those 182 students regions, regions in the VIP program, the vast majority of them are coming from different parts of the state. They're coming to live here at the university. Uh, we have a dedicated bus, bus line. We've been, thank you to the RTA. We've been working with them. Um, we're covering some minimal costs there to, to make sure this is um, uh, provided for the students. They're using it. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful program that is, again, bringing people in that would not otherwise be coming to Corpus Christi. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We're very proud of that program. Can I and ask about the future target? Over here? If for, for the future target, yeah. is that one year, five years? I, I would expect that in a couple of years. I, I would say two years. Uh, we are, um, uh, again, just uh, as early as two weeks ago, uh, we met, they have a new vice president of enrollment services, and uh, he has expressed... Uh, his interest in growing the program quicker than what we thought it was going to grow as well. Yep. So, uh, again, all, all signs tur turn uh, And, of course, Dr. Kitania is wonderful. She's very supportive of the program as, yep. well, as well. We, we, we think this program has um, the capacity to grow much beyond the 300, and those are our targets. I think there's been, again, there's been some, uh, some leadership changes and shifts over there and adjustments at a &MCC. We're waiting. Those are settling in nicely now, and we think uh, the 300 was not too far away. Sure. And just a side benefit, if I could uh, tell you about this program, our, our uh, staff has to work so closely together for the last year and a half putting this program together. It's just the relationships between them where it's non-VIP, just to call over there for certain students who need help with scholarships or anything like that. The relationship has grown really well that they can pick up a phone, they know who to call, and it's very kind of seamless now. So that's a, uh, one of those added benefits that's not directly related to VIP, but just the fact that we're working so closely together with them has really helped that interaction as well. And then the other uh, student group we like to talk about quite a bit is our dual credit headcount. Uh, again, it has had a, a slight increase. Uh, the 2,543 for this semester, that, in, that is 29 independent school districts that we're working with and about 36 high schools that we work with. And so again, that, that dual credit program is another great program. It's a great benefit for the students in our area, a great benefit for the parents in, our, in the area too. And that's what we've been going to go talk about. The, the financial benefits for students taking a program in high school and saving that money by just the tuition costs, not just the tuition costs, but also the books and housing is tremendous. So we, we keep on uh, out there and talking about this program. And, and again, uh, we also meet with our counterparts of CCISD uh, to strengthen the programs. Rita, if I may just add just a quick story on this. One of our students from, I think, 2012, 13 in that area uh, was at Sinton, Sinton High School. This young lady uh, was taking several classes, never, never intended to graduate from Del Mar College. In fact, never did. Ended up graduating from, graduating from the University of Texas and as of just a couple of weeks ago, came back as the uh, new news anchor at Channel 3. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. stay tuned. That's just a little uh, uh, tickler for everybody. I'm going to be bringing her back. She's a dear friend of the families. I remember helping her on a tough, there's a technical issue that Mr. Alfonso probably doesn't remember help, his team helping her through on, on, on Canvas or something. But anyway, just a little story about many of those students who do not intend to graduate that uh, benefited very much from there and are coming home. Stay tuned. Those are always great stories to hear. Okay. And again, uh, Regents, it wasn't a deep dive. I wanted to just give you a snapshot of what's going on right now. We're currently working and getting registered, uh, students registered for the second eight weeks, uh, which starts in two weeks already. So it's an ongoing effort. So any questions? A couple of questions. Mm -hmm. E-line. Mm -hmm. what, what's our full-time E-line student count? Regent, I am... We actually have, are you talking about for, student, for dual credits students? No, the full-time students that are taking the E-lines. Okay. We, the traditional student. Sure. I, I don't have just for dual credit only. I'm not sure. If, do we, you're, you're just talking about all students. Yeah. Or are you talking, talking about, about dual all credit students. students? I have the numbers for dual credit students, but. Who's, who's taking the E-line? 
Yeah, ten percent. It's close. I just talked to Cody the other day, and it's it's around ten, twelve percent. I'm I'm guessing. I don't have it here in front of me. We'll get that. Okay. And what's the trend? Is that increasing as a percentage? So very few, very few on the on the full time side. Um, that's been you know when I met with Cody the other day, and we were talking just about e learning because we're getting ready for our pres full presentation on that coming up soon. Stay tuned. I'm sorry. Next month. Next month. We'll have all those details for you, but I can you, wait. You can't. Okay, great, great. Because Cody's the expert, and I'm. You can tell I'm not. Uh, with yeah, that, uh, I didn't have that ready, but that ready. but but uh, very timely questions coming next month. And, and I've got a couple more questions. It looks like our increase from last year is 46 students. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, sir. And our increase in dual credit students would be 145. Mm -hmm. So that would mean our decrease in traditional students is 99 from last year to this year. Am I correct on that? That'd be correct. And I'm looking at the nine-year trend from 2010 to this year, and it looks like our dual credit's up about 1,348, and our traditional student count is down 1,379. So it looks like the national trend is happening right here. So, so here's the other part that's not in here because we just – it, it, it has yet to be calculated. What we're doing as we speak is um, there's another part of the sp of the fall semester that we're n that's not going to count be counted towards fall or anything else. But these will be individuals who will be here this fall, the second half, and we are opening up how many sections? Uh, in it's 50 sections this second eight weeks. In comparison, we had 19 sections. Yes, we have 50 new sections. Again, again, it's 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 not quite apples and apples, but they're all the the people that this is a new trend of ours. This is something we're working towards with the eight week strategy, and opening up 50 more sections. I just found out right before this board meeting that number, but there, that means 50 unique opportunities for students to come in and and uh and and add to that number now those are students a lot of those students are some that came in in the beginning of fall and we're recapturing and we're reaching back out to so there's those are students that we didn't get into the system uh initially and so um and not all of them are obviously going to be filling all those classes but we're, we're making a great effort of which there's several hundred of them out there um, that we're seeking to recapture. So we have some new strategies that are going to, my, my point with all this is we have some new strategies that are going to change the way these numbers look and shift, and we have to take snapshots and give them to the coordinating board at certain times, and we're going to give you those data, but we also, this is kind of the Paul Harvey rest of the story that's coming out um, that'll affect it. But to your point, um, um, the trends, the trends for our campuses right now are exactly what you're saying. Um, there, um, but at the same time, we're fighting every one of those trends every which way we can. But and so, in, in the last nine years, the enrollment's flat, and the dual credits up, yeah. and the traditional students down. The the last point that I would make, um, in addition to what you're saying, I'm not trying to contradict by any means. In addition to what you're saying, is the fact that we're up at all in that category during. The where the unemployment is at an all-time low, we should be down. Mm -hmm. We should be down overall. We have, and, and we have, an, I don't think the chart's in here, but I was doing a presentation last week to a couple of places, mayors, interagency, and others, where the trend is splitting, where we're, slight, we're, we're slightly up when the unemployment is going down. We should be down in the credit side. So we're bucking that trend. I think you and I talked about that one the other day. Um, it's a tough, it's a tough, tough market with, with the capacity that we have right now, with the teaching capacity and the number of, um, um, with the situation we have. And again, um, if we adhere to the strategic plan, as we say we're going to, and live by that strategic plan, I think we're going to see some trends continue to um, do better than we have in the past. That's I, our, that's I, our I guess the last question I have is, is this where we expect it to be? So in, with this unemployment market, with this unemployment rate, I would have said that we would have been down. And in fact- Our budget is, uh, was done for even, for a zero. Yeah, we, 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 we budgeted for fall for a flat increase and in the fact that we were up a percent, a little over a percent, not quite. Um, 
um, I predict I, I, I put my money on the table and said 2%. We we're going to be up 2% because of what I was hearing in the community. Dr. Lewis said 1%. She was more accurate than I was. The fact that we we're up at all um, in this economy is, is surprising. Uh, it doesn't make traditional sense, if you will. It doesn't make logical sense. But, but since 2010, we're really not up. Is that where we expected to be? It's, Given the strategies that we have, you know, um, of, of the traditional student, um, given where we are, it is a, it is a more gradual increase than, than, than what we've had. We've been growing in dual credit. Um, well, Mr. Bennett, I'm, I'm thinking we're doing really good, all things considered. It, it looks like it's meeting the national trend. The, the dual credit's up, the traditional's down. In some, yeah, in some ways, but I, and I, I still think there's, there's that, that's not the whole story yet. The story's developing is what I'm saying. Sure. And I think looking for Regent Bennett, is, it's hard to look in, into, because everything changes the economy. But Dr. Escamilla appointed a strategic enrollment management team that has met uh, two, three weeks ago. We're meeting again in about two weeks to look at what we can do for our traditional students to increase uh, student. And I really think that, that we can do that. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, the time their students want to take classes, traditionally nine to one. Uh, we're looking at uh, having what we call need to have more products on the shelves, uh, offering classes. So we're bringing together the academic deans, the student service deans, uh, the college relations office, all to be able to look down the down the road and increase what we could call we're calling traditional enrollments. Very good, Dr. Silva. Yes, are um, collegiate high school and branch academy students counted in this dual credit number? So those are 750, 800 students who are, because mm -hmm. there's 400 at Collegiate and another possible 400 at Branch Academy, correct? Right, a little bit less. A little, little, little bit less. That's about right. Okay, so mm -hmm. those students are actually on campus. Yes, ma'am. So we, so of that 2,500 number, 750 to 800 mm -hmm. are on campus, not at another high school. Correct. Yes, ma'am. So, so assuming that all 2,500 are someplace else, that we're not having to house them, I think is important. Maybe in future years you can show of that dual credit number how many are collegiate and branch academy because okay. again they're on campus. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I, it's not it is different than our traditional student because they're still in high school. But I think it's important to note that they are physically on campus. Sure, absolutely. Dr. Sherwood, um, I just wanted to say you know the headcount numbers are important, but I think uh, another thing that we would probably want to look at are the semester credit hours sure. because that's really a truer picture of I think of what um, even though we're not in a funding year, it's a truer picture mm -hmm. of what the patterns are with student enrollment. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Sure, and I think when uh, Vice President Garcia talks a little bit later, he'll talk about. Um, Think the upward tick in the tuition revenue. I don't want to take your, your presentation from you, but that that shows that probably when the headcount's not always up, maybe they're taking more classes uh, with that and combined with the uh, increased tuition. Dr. Sherwood, you, you nailed it. Uh, when we go over the financials, you're going to see some very interesting numbers. Headcount is good, but credit hour production is. To answer your question, uh, we just adopted a five-year strategy. So what we did 10 years ago, the strategic plan is different than what it's going to look for the next five years. So it's very hard to, to, to talk about you know, what transpired, transpired over a 10-year based on that five-year strategic plan and what it's going to look over the next five years. Uh, to your point, uh, Chair, uh, Madam Chair, is this next five years is really student-focused, and we're going to really see we're predicting some pretty good numbers as a result of that vision and, and some strategic initiatives that uh, Rito kicked off about a week ago to, to talk about ideas and initiatives. Any other questions? Yes, sir. There's no question <coughs> that the dual credit courses, you know, that should go up every year. No question. Okay, and the more that we get it out there and the people know and stuff, that because it's not going to cost us much, right? Yeah. But my question is that if a, any student registers here and let's say that his total bill is 3000 or whatever, what does he do? I mean, I've heard that they have to pay like half of it and some they can't pay half. I mean, so it, you know what I'm talking about? Is that something that's... Well, it, it could be if a student selects to do an installment plan, then that is half down 
Right. Uh, and, and, they, and so that is for students who don't get financial aid or, or right. don't get anything. Yeah, that, that's one of the options because they could either you know, pay in full or use the installment plan. So it sounds like you might be talking to a student who selected to do an installment plan. Right. So, so you're saying half down right off the bat? Correct. I mean, I don't see how kids can afford that. Yeah. Parents, not here, not anymore. And, and then that is, in order for us to report a student to the coordinating board, the, the coordinating board wants 50% down to be able to, to do that. Well, I think that that's one of the things that, you know, we really need to look at, you know, I mean, because, I mean, that's going to be hard. I mean, it's hard for me if I were to do that. My daughter, my kids, whatever, you know, 1500 they don't have it. So we have to, as grandparents, you know, help them out. Yeah. And I suspect that's something that's happening all over. And so some kids, I know that they can't. They can't because they can't come up with that. So you're going to do an installment plan, but yet right off the bat, that's like going and buying a car the way they have it at the ads. Mm -hmm. They're going to pay you 169 a month, but then down there it says, you got to give 10% or 20% down. Mm -hmm. Come on, same thing is happening here. Mm -hmm. So the kids, I mean, right now the kids, they won't. Sure, so I think that that's one of the things that maybe we need to look at. And of course, it's just me talking, you know, but I know that kids or parents tell me about that and said, we couldn't register because of that. Mm -hmm. So, and I understand, you know, the installment plan, yeah. But half of whatever the bill is, it's hard. Sure, sure. And for those things, we really want to encourage the financial aid as well. Yeah, and uh, of course, you know, if they, yeah, and I try to encourage people about financial aid, no matter what, because anything's going to help, you know. Absolutely. And so, you know, and I like the idea that now anybody that qualifies for not financial aid will automatically, SEOG or TPEC is going to be, you know, brought up to them because I guess some of them didn't know about that, you know, unless they put it in there that they sure. wanted to apply for sure. that. But now you were telling me the last time that it's going to be already uh, – well, and, and those funds come at a first come first serve. Right, and I understand that first come first serve. Yes, sir. So then, so when it comes in and it's early, mm -hmm. we don't have to tell that student because yeah. he was there That's early right. and stuff, and the money was there, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, again, you know, that was something that really, when when I heard about that, I said, wow, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, can you imagine if the bill is four thousand, mm -hmm. and they got to come up with two thousand? It, it won't. That that Never. it won't be that high ever. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, I'm just saying, you know. But yeah. let's say three thousand. But it, it, the most be about, even then, that's it won't even that even an out of district student, an out of district student would be around two thousand for a full load. For a full load. Yeah, for a full, for load. A full yeah. load. It's got to be a full time student, okay? But that's, I mean, let's say two thousand. Still, you know, thousand yeah. dollars is still. At the end of the day, when when you don't, yeah, at the end of the day, uh, every every. The, the the number's relative and, and whether it's four thousand, two thousand or one thousand, it's it's all the same if it's not there. Mm -hmm. And we understand that. And we uh, with Mr. Joseph and others in, in financial aid, the team, we, we do everything we can to make sure we don't turn away students that that don't have the funds. We sit down with them, we engage them, mm -hmm. um, we help them go through those processes and make sure that they have that they understand what all their opportunities are. No, Joseph is right there. Joseph, come on up, come on up on this one. This one's really important. This is all about the student experience. Uh, Joseph is our director of financial aid. When those students are coming through, describe how they'll come through, Joseph, and, and when, they, when they describe their needs and, and how, what we do to retain as many as we possibly can on the front end. So, so the idea now is, you know, a student, when they fill out the free application or fellow student aid, we receive their their ISO record, a clean ISO record, we try to, uh, well, we automatically package them a Pell Grant. If, if they're eligible, we automatically accept that Pell Grant as well. So that way those resources are already available. And like uh, Dr. Silva mentioned on a first come first serve basis, uh, if they qualify for additional aid, like a Texas Public Education Grant or Texas Education Opportunity Grant or SEOG Grant, we try to give them at least one other grant so they're covering tuition and fees, books, and then a little bit of money for hopefully educational related expenses. But uh, as Dr. Escamilla mentioned, we, we're trying to engage the student more by uh, our communication patterns up front when we're reaching out to the student and send, sending them award letters, not necessarily having to come in and request the additional funds. If we have it, we're going to give it. Cause you know, we don't get bonuses or anything like that. Uh, we hold on to those funds. So definitely our job is to administer that aid uh, to those students up front and, and try to spread the wealth as much as possible. We want to try to help as many students as we can, sir. No, and I understand financial aid. If a kid, you know, qualifies financial aid, heck yes, yeah. school is almost going to be free. Yes, I'm just saying about the ones that don't qualify financial aid, yeah. you know, and there's 
they got to come up front half of what their bill is, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard. Sure. It's so it's, hard. that's always our hope that they will engage the financial aid office, come over, let's, let's talk about it. What can we do as an office? Maybe they don't qualify for Pell Grants, but maybe a state grant that we can assist them with or some institutional funds that we can try. We want to try to be our... Uh, in, you know, engage the student more, and, and that's the environment we're creating. We're the foundation as well. Yeah, and that's what I was kind of looking for. You know, what else is there that we can do? We not go out there and talk to you know, talk to parents or kids or whatever, because I'm always trying to let them know, you know, about what we've got here, and you know, and, and where the kids can just come on here, get all their basics out of here, and then they can go someplace else, right? And since Del Mar is really recognized as far as it's less costly here than it would be in a four-year school. Yeah. Okay, and the fact that the Del Mar Junior College has always been recognized as a very highly academic institution. Ever since I've known Del Mar, it's been, you know, rated real high academically. Okay, but the fact is that I think that we are now in a situation where things have changed so much, you know. It's changed so much for a lot of people. And one of them is, sure, if a kid comes in and what you just said, really, that I like. The fact that you said that, hey, if the kid, okay, only if they know. If they don't know that and they tell them there, well, you got to come up with so much. And they don't tell them that to go and see what anybody else can do. They're not going to do it. They're going to walk away. But uh, anyway, that's just. Sure. And we just know, we'd we always uh, encourage all students to come to our financial aid office. Even if they're not eligible for Pell Grants, like Mr. Ruiz said, there might be something else they're eligible for. Uh, and then we can also refer them to a foundation. And there's also loans available. Now, we try to do loans as the last options. You know, we all know that we don't want our students to be uh, leaving us with debt. Right. Uh, so that's the last option. But if it's whether not to go to school or go to school, I think an investment in their schooling is might be Because, you know, loan, even the books nowadays, you know, if the kid qualifies for tuition and fees and all that in the books, I mean, they cost an arm and a leg now, you know. Absolutely. Very expensive books, right? And so, anyway, the fact is that, yeah, you'd like to be able to do as we like to do as much as we can, and I appreciate anything you guys can do to to try and make it easier for these people so they can enroll and they can be here, and uh, and eventually, who knows? You know, I mean, I came to Del Mar, and I was not the brightest student in the world. You know what? But I made it, and I got my master's. And if anybody was said this crazy guy was going to have his master's, I'd have said you're crazy, because I didn't. I got kicked out of Texas and Corpus Christi. I got kicked out of Texas and Corpus Christi. I didn't have the grades, right? And so now I got my master's and I did. And it was just a matter of giving that opportunity that I didn't know I had. They gave me that opportunity and I was able to do it. And I just want the same opportunity to be given to all the people here in Corpus in South Texas, you know, in our region, because Absolutely. they deserve it, you know. And that's what we are now. Economically, yes, they're not all that well stable, a lot of them. And a lot of the kids that we have here, same thing. And so all I'm saying is I appreciate what you just said, sir, but you know that you're gonna guys Try to do everything you can to keep our kids here Absolutely. because you never know that kid eventually he's going to do okay he'll wake up like i did and he's going to say you know what i can do it yes sir so thanks a lot so much thank you yes sir thank there, you sir there are just while you're up there yeah. there are a lot of kids that do qualify for financial aid but for some reason or another the parents don't want to fill out the paperwork are we doing anything to try to encourage that or try to change that so, way so of thinking one, yes sir uh, so one of the the messages that we're trying to put out in the high schools uh, and uh, is you know letting families know everybody qualifies for something it doesn't matter if you make ten thousand dollars a year a million dollars a year everybody is eligible to receive some form of financial aid how much and what type is determined on so that message that we're sending uh, in like I, I'm we're in the process of hiring a financial aid outreach advisor which we're really thankful for because that person will be one-on-one -on -one contact in the high schools. Right now I'm kind of picking up some of that slack going to the high schools myself, talking to uh, parents, presenting. Um, I'll, I'll be at H.M. King tomorrow evening and then Thursday in Sinton. Anybody that will listen to me, I'll, I'll tell them that you qualify for something. It doesn't matter what your income level is, but what type of financial aid is what we got to determine based on expected family contribution and things like that. There's so, but, but parents are, in some cases, reluctant to provide that. So the only option that a, a student would have would be unsubsidized loan. And they, they actually indicate that on the FAFSA application. I'm unable to provide parental information. Then they'll ask if they have a special circumstance. If they do not, they could, they'll just give them an unsubsidized loan only, which we, we really don't want that for our students. But 
we try to talk to the parents, but ultimately, it, bottom line, it's their decision. And there's also the new law, Regents, exactly. that requires um, all high school seniors to fill out the FAFSA before they graduate. So the big push is coming. That, things is things are changing. Effect? Yes, it's it's already started, okay. and uh, the state of uh, Louisiana mm -hmm. uh, found it to be a uh, very positive experience there. They had some really good outcomes, and that's going to be having a big impact on, on all of our students It's already well. in effect here in Texas? Yes. It will students. actually be required in 2022-23 is when it will be officially. So, so, so they have this it's entire not, it's year. It's the freshman, soft, right sophomores, now. sophomores, class this my, year my in kids' school. Okay. Yep. By the Before time they're graduate. seniors, they'll be required. So schools are kind of getting used to the idea. So that's why, I mean, it's like we're in almost every high school, every like every night somewhere else. Yeah, yes, sir. But thank you all very much. We kind of got a little, little awesome. far afield on, on enrollment right. update into thank financial aid, but those, those are the things that impact enrollment. So thank you all very much for thank that. Thank you. Our uh, next report is going to be on the write-offs uh, from our accounts receivable. Uh, Mr. Garcia. Yep. Afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. President, members of the Board of Regents. Regarding student receivable write-offs, in accordance with Board Policy 4.20, I am recommending the write-off of receivables for financial reporting purpose, valued at $232,000 uh, and 231, uh, 232,231. These receivables relate to operating activities from fall 2015 to summer 2016, and they represent less than 1% of the annual gross tuition and fee revenues. During the three-year period ending today, the college has attempted various collection efforts on these receivables that include student billing, sending collection letters, and placing student account holds, preventing the college from issuing student-related records. It is important to note that the student account hold will remain in place until the financial obligation is paid in full. Uh, so, Madam Chair, Mr. President, members of the region, that concludes my report for today. Questions? Are there any questions? Ms. Saber, Dr. Schroeder? Um, I just wanted to ask about the, the largest number there, the financial aid adjustments. Can you help us understand that one a sure, little bit Sure, absolutely. So the majority of the receivable relates to the Title IV return of uh, financial aid funds. This is a requirement to return financial aid back to the U.S. Department of Education uh, no later than 45 days after the student has withdrawn from classes. And so because, you know, we have a large amount of part-time students, they're very t transient, and sometimes it's very difficult to get a hold of and talk to them about settling this outstanding obligation. Do we contract with an outside um, firm at all to help with collections? Very good question. So uh, I would have to say up until two years ago, we had a business relationship with a collection agency. And fortunately, uh, the benefits did not justify the cost. And so uh, we are currently working on, uh, John and myself and uh, some other of uh, my uh, colleagues, to uh, issue a RFQ uh, to see if we can partner up with uh, another collection agency. So. Uh, more to come on that. And does this number stay relatively flat year to year? Is it something that we budget for? So that is a good question. So my conversation with our controller, John, who is currently out at a, uh, at a very important meeting with one of our uh, uh, important uh, uh, committees, uh, it's my understanding that it's always been below 1% of total revenue. So it's pretty much consistent. So there hasn't been any anomalies, I want to say, in the last five years. And how does it work as far as the financial aid, like if I qualified financial aid, and so then that money is not going to be given to me right there, is it? And it's when I register, they're going to take for tuition fees from there. I mean, how does that work? Because, I mean, yes. are you talking about that the... Uh, the people that don't pay it back, but are we talking about the loans or are we talking about financial aid? So, so this particular, the big dollar amount that you see right here, uh, let me point this out for you. The 169. The 169, that's the federal financial aid 
uh, return of funds piece that we were just talking about. And uh, Rito, so can you talk about a little bit more that? What happens is when a student has an account, let's say $1,200, and that is deducted from Foundation. their tuition fee, so mm -hmm. nothing comes out of pocket. After the 12th class day, they receive whatever is owed to them back. Yeah. What this money uh, uh, talks to, and Dr. Show with your question, it is the students who withdraw after we give them the money. So it's after 12th class day, we've given Raul Garcia the money, and then he withdraws from school yeah. before 60th class day. Okay. Those are the students who then owe money. Uh, that's what we call the return to Title IV. Yeah, because it's not just the tuition fees, but anything. The books can be also taken out of there, right? Yes, exactly. It's so in other words, whatever's left at the end, because that's the one that they get draw. They withdraw after the 12th class day. That's the one that, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to try and get. Yes, okay. yes, that is correct. Okay. Any other questions or comments? This is an administrative report, so there's no action on this. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Great. Thank you. Uh, you're going to stay here and talk to us about the bookstore update. Yes, okay. So, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, a request for proposals for the management of the Del Mar College uh, bookstore operations was issued on August 19, 2019, uh, two <coughs> weeks ago. The college has recently completed the vendor selection process with a recommendation by unanimous vote uh, by the committee to award the contract to Texas Book Company. The term of the contract is for two years with five one-year extensions for a maximum of seven years. The estimated commission for the seven-year period is estimated at $2.4 million for the college, which includes $150,000 sign-in bonus. The next step is to finalize the terms and conditions of the contract agreement. From a student affordability uh, solution perspective, uh, Texas Book Company offers the sale of used books, book rentals, and book buyback program. In addition, uh, they have an all-inclusive access program which del delivers a digital material ebook solution at, um, at a, uh, that can be used uh, with multiple technology uh, devices. Uh, the program is offered through their strategic partnership with Red Shelf and Vital Source. The college also received proposals from Follett and Barnes and Noble College. Each vendor was assessed based on the quali their qualifications, the company's financial health, textbook cost and price, and uh, operating concepts and financial considerations. The 11 committee uh, membership is representative of the college's governing uh, body consisting of three executive team leaders, including myself uh, as the chair, four deans, the Office of Financial Aid, the Office of Purchasing, the Office of Information Technology, and a member of our student government. That concludes my report. Is that Any the, questions? Is that the company that has it right now? I'm sorry, what was that? Is that the same company that has it right now? That is correct. It's the same company. Yes, sir. Can you, one more question. Can you, uh, you gave us a total of what we'll get over five years, but what is the percentage more or less? in the contract so they guarantee a minimum of three hundred thousand a year Here. and so this last past year i think we earned about uh close to two hundred ninety thousand. so we're already ahead of this uh of the game today i don't know if i should have asked answered that question no, in good. public now they know our uh, numbers <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> any other questions or comments yes sir uh i was uh, wondering like for example i know we're talking about the books you know the bookstore books. yes sir but they have other things there in the bookstore besides the books, right? Yes, they, they do have other merchandising okay, uh, now, items. That yes, merchandise, is that uh, something that we also have for contract for so many years or what? How does it work? So uh, the contract is, 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 is a bundle of services that includes the merchandising piece of it. And so there is a commission component to that as well. So mm -hmm. that, uh, those numbers are included in the figures that I quoted you earlier. Mm -hmm. So now if uh, there's a company here in Corpus that can beat whatever they have there, the, any kind of shirts, cap, bags, whatever that says Delmar. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we know that? How, 
when is the deadline for that? Is there going to be another time that's going to come up that they can make a presentation to us or whatever? Yeah, so, so I think if I understand your question, what you're, you're asking us is, is can we uh, break out the two components, which is the book versus the retail merchandising piece? And I, I guess at the end of the day, you know, in order, because it is a very uh, competitive industry, right? And you really need to bundle all of this together to really get good pricing out there. So if you start separating it, you know, it becomes very difficult and we may not end up with uh, the commission that we are currently being quoted and, on. And that's just out of the bookstore. That's the yeah. merchandise that's just, I mean, I say just out of the bookstore. It's not the only merchandiser that we work with. I don't, I don't know the names offhand, but I know that there are other merchandising companies that have contracts with us and that are, or that are at least on our vending list that we go out for many other um, items. Okay, so that, that's not the only source for that. So what I'm saying is if there's any other companies out there in the community uh, getting on our vendor list and then going after some of the, 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 the contracts and those types of things, uh, Jay, I know Jay does a lot of work with that out of public relations office that is not the bookstore. Yeah, okay, because I know that, you know, of course, they got to be in the vendor list like you say. Yes, sir. You know, but the fact is that if the merchandise that's there here in Corpus, somebody can beat that big time i mean how do we go about it you know i mean so, so we if, if 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 you're talking about the book the merchandise in the bookstore mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. okay so that's that's a part of of this particular contract um that goes with hand in hand with the books and all that yeah it's all part of the bigger contract and we leverage that big contract to get the best prices that we can and yeah. and um and then the uh um the, the other payments that they make towards us that we that we uh, have for, what do we call them a roll? I'm sorry. I'm yeah, so, so like it's it. part of the- Mission, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's part of making it affordable for our students at the end of the day. So definitely want to have a, a nice, broad, you know, selection of, of merchandise. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, the bookstores or these companies, they're really leveraging that additional sales to really give us a better pricing. So to your point, if we were to award this to another contract, then uh, my expectation would be that the pricing or the cost of the books is going to go up uh, to, for our students. And so at the end of the day, you know, our strategic vision is really to focus our energy in making uh, the cost of the tuition for our students more affordable and that includes text textbooks. Yeah. Used bookstore, used books are what the books. students go after. That's the big bread and butter that is opportunity for our sure. students that they go after to save money. Uh, books are expensive, but uh, we're doing everything we can to keep, to keep that relationship. Yeah. And then also looking at the long haul um, with this company and or just books all in, in general is something that we're focusing on and, uh, and really trying to stay in touch with what the students' needs are so that we can make sure that future contracts are around what our students are looking for. What we know now is the students are going after, the, the, the vast majority of students are going after used books from our standpoint, and that's really what this contract uh, yeah. provides for. Now, the, the other thing, and this is gonna be the last thing I'm gonna ask, is that the company that's doing it, where are they from? Are they from the town? Greenville, Texas. From where? Greenville, Texas. Just out of Dallas. Just outside Dallas, I know it well. Yes, and we've been doing business with them for several years. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I, I've met with the CEO several times. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McDonald is going to come up and give us our annual review of professional service contracts. Yes, thank you. I provided you the list of the professional service contracts. And again, I, I color coded the list so that it kind of highlights if there are any changes that are going to happen this year. So if it's highlighted in yellow, that means that contract will be expiring sometime in 2019. If it's in orange, that means it has already expired in 2019. Um, there are actually no blue highlights, so there were no contract date changes um, since the last time we reported this. And um, I'll show you the, the, like this time I'm showing you a contract that expired this year. The next time I provide you with a list, that contract will actually drop off the list. So I'll show it to you one time once it's expired and then it'll drop off. So if you look at the first section of the, the actual first page of the list, if you want to go back a page, um, there's a, I highlighted in orange, it was the Collier Johnson Woods contract that has expired. But if you look right below that, there's already a new contract in place, and that's our external auditors. 
Now, if you do go to the next page, the yellow highlight shows that the contract with Cleary, uh, Cleary Zimmerman will expire at the end of this year. So at the end of December 2019, that contract will expire. If there is a need for the college to extend it, there are provisions in it. But for, for now, that is the contract expiration date. If we go to the next page, um, it's also showing you that the Texas Book Company contract expires. We did issue a one-month extension to carry it through the end of October, but as Mr. Garcia just uh, mentioned, they are working on entering into a new contract with with uh, the bookstore. With, and there was one new contract added since the last time I presented, and that would be the contract for Phase 1 on Southside with Fulton. So that's the only new addition to the list at this time, besides this, the Collier Johnson Woods new contract also. Any questions? Question on the AGCM contract? We just finished $70 million of construction, and we're just beginning $117 million in construction. That percentage fee that we're paying them, that's based on the construction amount, is it not? I'm going to look for the AGCM <coughs> I'd have to go back and look and look hourly at the contract rate. It shows an you. hourly rate here, not a, not a percentage. Yeah, it's not a, I don't think that one shows a percent. Excuse me. Uh, I'm showing that we're paying them 4.1% of the contract. Is that correct? Go ahead, Mr. Bonza. I don't have the contract detail with me. It's on. There's an hourly rate on mine. The the MM, the the contract for AGCM is stipulated specifically for the 14 and 16 bond, and is defined by projects, and it's per hour per roll, and it's it has a not to exceed value. So it is defined by the amount of estimate of services they're going to provide for independent services. I'm confused then because I've I've done some research on on those types of contracts, and they're generally on a sliding scale based on the value of the contract, and the the projects that I'm looking at, when they exceed fifty million dollars, their percentage is two percent. When they exceed a hundred million dollars, the percentage drops to one point five percent. Uh, that's not correct. On the contract with AGCM, it's on a per hour basis. Well, I understand and, and that, but I'm, my question is, why is it different than, than what I'm finding on my research? Uh, I, I do not have your, what you have in I your hands, sir. other contracts? Uh, the, the general contract management. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, just, just to remind you, it is the, uh, we went, the college went for a request for a proposal, RFQ, for construction management. And uh, the AGCM is, uh, is a successful responder. And uh, their contract with the college is specifically defined on an agreement between Delmar College as, uh, with AGCM per hour, per role, and it's not based on percentage. And when we sent out that request, was it for the $70 million or was it for the $190 million? For the seven, it is specifically defined based on the funding for the 14 bond and the funding for the 16 bond. Which would be 296 million? Uh, 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 it depends on the project. For the current contract, for example, for the 14 bond, it specifically defined their role and the, the, uh, the project management and the staffing assigned to the projects are specifically defined depending on the role a per hour basis. And if there's a particular scope of work that is listed in the go negotiated contract, so it's not open-ended for everything. It's there's specific scope of work that they are to provide. At the college's request, we can add additional scopes of work, but only if we request it. And then they identify personnel and an hourly rate for those particular type of functions that we may need for any type of service from that contract um, construction management role. But when it, went, when it went out, it was for particular scopes of work to assist in services for uh, projects to do with the bonds that we asked for. It wasn't uh, for 
Yeah. Open so, ended everything. So it's hourly and not to exceed. Yes, hourly the protection for the college defined. is the fact that, as Tammy said, the college, in, if in writing that we have additional projects, we can request them to provide an estimate in, and they can uh, respond in writing as well and, and the college can accept or reject. But as it is right now for the 14 bond and 16 bond, uh, to protect the college as the contract uh, is designed to do so, we do have stipulations for the 14 bond and 16 bond uh, not to exceed amount in both the projects. Okay, so I was not around here when you sent out that request. W was that request for a $70 million contract? I was not uh, in this role when, when the request came out too, but uh, I'll Could I address that to too? discuss that with you. <laughs> So, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna, that's going to be specific enough that we'll have to go back and... Could, and could I get up. some history on that? Because the research that I'm seeing yes. is dramatically different from the 4.1% that we're paying, and I'd like to be able to reconcile the two. We'll be glad where do you, to... Where do you see 4.1%? That's what I, I, I don't understand. That's the amount that AGCM has been getting paid on the contract. So on, on a $100 million contract, at, they at get $4,100,000. hourly rate. No. They, they've got a 4.1%. Yeah. Uh, to, to add details to, the, to, to what uh, the college has been paying for what AGM has been invoicing, there are a number of people assigned to the East and West, and depending on their role, they have a different rate per hour, and it's, uh, you know, and it's uh, paid as invoice and as incurred. And I printed out the most recent one from the e-builder, and it calculates out to 4.1%. But they're not, they're, are you saying that that's what it calculates out, but they're not billing based on a percentage, they're no. billing based on hourly? Thank you. Okay. Possibly. They're, they're billing on, a ba uh, uh, on an hourly basis. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on the um, professional services contract report? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. All right, we will move into our college president's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, really quickly, again, uh, the U.S. Department of Education um, has uh, awarded Del Mar College a $2.8 million grant. Uh, we just had the press release, if you were able to be there. Thank you all for those who are in attendance. Uh, this is a $2.8 million grant that will support, uh, again, advising uh, for the college by way of a Hispanic serving institution, Title V, um, designated grant just really quickly and I know we talk about this and this is a point that I think we've we did not bring up earlier the number of advisors that we have on this campus is in the hundreds and I want to make that point of clear, clear of clarity other than something I talked about before we, we have one of the we're one of the few colleges well, let me just say one of the colleges in the minority that that um, uh, that offer that have a faculty advising model and yes, we have um, a, a relatively good number of, of advisors right now. We always say we don't have enough, but uh, this grant will enable us to add more advisors per se. Um, our combination is a, is a, a, a model that is uh, set both centralized, decentralized, and a faculty model. We have the, the hybrid model. So we have all the tools on the table right now, and that's what our QEP is gonna be working to shape up and hone and, and provide for our students. That being said, congratulations to the college on Project Senda for the Title V uh, grant for $2.8 million over five years to support that effort. Timely could not have come at a better time. Um, uh, on September 12th, um, I and uh, Ms. Lenora Keyes and I know Chair, Chairwoman Scott were at the Gulf Coast Growth Ventures site tour and groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, Re uh, Regent uh, Averett was there as well. I remember. Uh, it was a it was a great um, opportunity to go take on and take in that massive complex. It's just incredible. Uh, on the 17th, um, I attended as well as many regents. I know Regent Bennett and others were were at the um, Del Mar College Creative and Scholarly Works uh, Expo. I want to thank all the regents and everyone who was able to attend that day. It was an opportunity to celebrate. Um, what our faculty and, and some other staff members do best, and that is um, they ex express their creative side and uh, th by way of their works. So that concludes my reports. So I'll answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Dr. Escamilla? Seeing none, thank you, sir. You're welcome. 
Uh, under Regents reports, there are a couple of items um, that wanted to, to call your attention to and have an opportunity to discuss. A um, couple of things, we've had a couple of requests from Regents to look at uh, our public comment policy. And so there is a draft policy that is there for your review. Um, the, we have had that vetted by our college council and, and uh, we'll run a couple of more traps before it is adopted. Uh, but the idea would be that uh, in compliance with both our policy and state law, we are putting a little bit more meat to the bones. Uh, and, and in practice, prior to the start of meetings, we'd ask individuals who would like to address the board to uh, sign a registration card and indicate whether they're speaking on a specific item uh, and or general comment. Uh, the individuals, uh, if anybody has handouts, they would need to provide those to our board liaison uh, prior to the start of the meeting. Uh, three minutes for public comments. Uh, individuals cannot yield that, uh, any portion of their time to someone else. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's a section on rules of decorum and on the provisions for uh, if somebody violates the, that decorum. In general, we will look at doing public comment uh, right after the recognitions portion of our meeting agenda and limit that time to no more than 30 minutes. Uh, there will be public comment allowed on specific agenda items uh, before the board takes action on those agenda items as has been our practice. And then uh, there is an opportunity for the board chair to uh, temp temporarily modify or suspend the application of those rules uh, if applicable. Are there questions or comments on that? We wanted to give you all a chance to look at it and absorb it and have discussion. And uh, if there are changes you'd like to see or revisions, uh, then we can have that as an action item uh, at our next monthly meeting. Ms. Carroll, I have a yes. question. With number one, prior to the start of a board meeting, what if somebody comes, comes and they want to speak on a certain item and they're running like five minutes late? That's as prior to the start of a board meeting. Can they still? Yes, I, th I think in practice, again, the chair will have the prerogative uh, to allow for that to happen. I think the idea is if there is, is a large group of some kind that we want to have some ability to, to understand how the flow of the meeting is going to happen before the meeting starts, but it would be the prerogative of the chair of the board uh, to suspend to recognize, that. that okay, that's to correct. recognize that person. That's correct. So it will be possible for someone running late yes. to be able to speak. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, then you'll see that back as an action item uh, at our next, uh, our next board Sounds meeting. Uh, the other item uh, that is there uh, from a draft policy standpoint uh, is directly related to our board self-evaluation uh, from earlier this year. There was specific language around the board wanting to have a better process and understanding, uh, have, have a stated process by which the board will review its policies on a regular basis. Uh, so again, staff has drafted this for our consideration um, and, and, in, and pretty much mirrors our practice right now. I'm not gonna go through and read all of that to you, uh, but would like to note that the board B policies are what we'll be paying a special attention to, and that all board policies as well as administrative procedures are available online uh, for anyone who wants to access those. There's going to be, let's see, on page 79, uh, you'll see primary ownership and secondary ownership of the, the manual, and then a policy review schedule that lays out over a 10-year period for the board to look at uh, each of the chapters. Uh, chapter one, the board will actually look at every other year because that's the one that most directly relates to our work. But there will be an opportunity for um, the board to have a process by which you're looking at all the chapters of the policy manual. Uh, and the other thing to understand, that this does not preclude staff from bringing policies forward to us as necessary either by uh, accreditation, legislation, or practice uh, that they need the board to consider for amendments. But I think this would, would I think, put in a little bit more structure uh, what the board requested our self-evaluation on, on board policy review. We're just talking about board policy, not yes. policies. Yes, correct. This, this does refer and define a policies and the procedure for that, but that is at the college president's discretion and, and through the shared governance process and other 
other policies that apply to this. Madam Chair, also yes. the board always has the initiative, you know, to bring a, a policy question for mm -hmm. consideration. This doesn't lock you in to only considering it when it's scheduled. Correct. Thank you for that yeah. clarification. And once again, we do, we do not have a hard copy policy manual anymore, right? It's just a uh, online. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Right. We do not just. We do not distribute a hard copy unless there's a special request from someone that, that, that needs it. Um, I have, don't recall that ever being the case. Do you, Ms. Delia? Yeah. Anybody ever requesting a hard copy? No. And there's not a standalone uh, practice or a, a practice of generating that either. Any other questions or comments? This will also be on our agenda then at the next m meeting for adoption. And if you if you have any questions or concerns, if you would let me know or um, or Mr. Rivera as well, um, that would be helpful. Thank you. And then the last item uh, under Regents Report uh, again was directly related to our board self evaluation in wanting to uh, specifically address opportunities for the board to have training in uh, the financial uh, our fiduciary responsibilities. So uh, a couple of things to highlight for you. Um, there is a session at the ACCT annual conference uh, that staff has recommended to us uh, on five-year budget modeling, performance metrics, and board policy. Uh, it is being uh, led by Lone Star College, uh, Dr. Stephen Head, their chancellor, uh, Alton Smith, their board chair, and Jennifer Mott, their CFO. It's going to be Thursday, October 17th at 10.30 a.m. Uh, so staff specifically recommended that session to us for, for training if we'd like it. Um, Dr. Escamilla and Ms. Villarreal have arranged for Ro Roland Gilmore, who's a senior program director at the coordinating board to provide specific training for Del Mar College Regents. This will be a webinar. You can do it from your desk at home or at work, or if you don't have access uh, to, to facilities that for a webinar, you can come to the president's office. That's going to be on November 14th at 10 a.m. Natalie's going to send you the details, uh, so don't, don't worry about writing them down unless you want to, but we appreciate the opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about the financial indicators that the coordinating board uh, is looking at. Um, and again, this will be led by a coordinating board director, uh, number 14th at 10 a.m. And then the, the last opportunity for, not last opportunity, the next opportunity for us, uh, Mr. Garcia is actually going to be working with us at our December Board of Regents meeting. And not sure if this is gonna be in the regular meeting or as a workshop beforehand, uh, but specifically on those financial indicators and the new KPIs that are part of our strategic plan uh, so that we can talk specifically about how those indicators, what they mean to Del Mar College and some of our specific numbers. So those are three opportunities uh, specifically related again to our board self-evaluation that we wanted to bring, bring up for your, your attention. A while back it used to be a requirement of board members, especially new board members, to take a seminar or either watch a video on, on Public Investment Act. That uh, still is. That still is. That still is the case. Yes, sir. And it's still awful. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's a video of someone oh, giving an old PowerPoint saw, presentation. Actually, actually <laughs> when I first got on the board, they sent us to Austin to, to, to do that oh. uh, half a day. So Delia has a copy of that DVD, and you can plug it in and, and watch it. But this is an opportunity for us to, to potentially be interactive. And so I really appreciate the, 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 the things that staff has put together for us uh, to be interactive and to make sure that we get our questions answered. Um, and again, uh, directly related to, to what the board expressed and uh, is, is a desire for additional training in that regard. Uh, at our next uh, board meeting, we will also have an opportunity under Regents Reports to uh, come back and report on what happened at the ACCT conference. So just as an FYI, uh, for those of you who might want to uh, share presentations uh, or share synopsis, we'll, we'll do that at our next meeting under Board of Regents business. Any other questions or comments for that? If not, we'll move on to pending business. Um, 
and you will see we've we've lengthened our pending business list quite a bit uh, tried to, to keep track of comments and questions and, and uh, referrals and, and things that are coming up so we've got quite a number of things on our agenda today and you will see in November uh, we're, we're targeting a student housing update grant management audit uh, there is uh, the TERS policy and abatement policy review um, our SACS and QEP updates e-learning etc uh, so if you see things on the pending agenda that you have questions about or if you uh, notice something that is not there that, that you thought was going to be followed up, please let me know and I'll make sure that we get that added to our pending list. The, the tourist policy is just policy in general regarding tourists, not specifically North Beach? Correct, correct. Okay. So we'll have, have a, a draft policy for review in November. Any other questions or comments about our pending business? Seeing none, we will move on to our consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda items uh, include a minutes from our August 27th and September 10th meeting and acceptance of the investments for September of 2019. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented? So moved, Madam Chair. Motion by Mr. Rivas. Is there a second? Second by Dr. Sherwood. Uh, any, uh, is there any public comment on our consent agenda? Seeing none. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. That motion carries. Moving on to our regular agenda. Uh, Mr. Garcia is going to give us an update on the quarterly investment report. Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board, today we have a special guest that will go over the quarterly investment report and trending financial and geopolitical activities impacting our yields. Let me introduce you to David McElwain from Patterson and Associates. Hello, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me, and I'm uh, happy to review the investment portfolio with you guys. It's been a challenging year for the financial markets. We've seen Treasury yields doing about face from uh, this time last year. And obviously, uh, the United States has still been the strongest economy uh, globally uh, when compared to so many of the other countries around. Um, right now, our, our economy seems to be kind of cooling off a little bit. Uh, some of the statistics that are coming in, we've had two months in a row where our manufacturing uh, levels have declined. And the rest of the world is facing serious growth issues. And you can see the little chart here. We've got uh, a growing number of countries that actually have negative yields on their bonds. Um, it's kind of hard to conceptually get your, eye, you know, your uh, mind around having a negative yield. But there's so much fear that you know, people, are, if they have to buy their country's debt, they're actually bidding the price of that debt up so much that the price exceeds the interest earnings. And so the people who are trading that debt are simply hoping it'll appreciate further from where they're purchasing it as a way to make their yield. Fortunately, we don't have that problem, but a, a number of countries that can buy U.S. debt have started to flood into our markets and created more demand for you know, treasury, uh, uh, treasury bills and, and treasury bonds. So we've got this uh, yield environment right now that's been coming down very sharply. We've been climbing a wall of worry. Uh, we've got these tensions with China on trying to strike some uh, trade deals with them. And, um, you know, the longer that the uncertainty persists, you know, we're seeing people cut back on their capital spending budgets, which is causing our economic data to gradually contract here. So, you know, there's, there's the potential that maybe some of this can go away if we can find some friendlier terms uh, with, with China. But until we do reach that point, we've got Brexit as another potential catalyst to uh, create a little more fear in the debt markets and a little more demand for those products. Um, the one thing that has remained somewhat healthy is consumer spending here has, uh, again, kind of carried the torch for the U.S. economy. And, you know, hopefully that will continue to be the case. But um, I think uh, as long as this unemployment rate doesn't start to increase, we'll probably be on solid uh, footing. 
Um, as you know, the Federal Reserve has reversed course. Um, in November of last year, the markets were anticipating that the Fed was probably going to raise interest rates a couple more times. And uh, they did raise, in fact, in December, but they dramatically altered their language to say that they were now going to monitor the data. And the markets eventually kind of flipped to the other side, and we saw yields start to go down in, in advance of the FOMC actually making their, their first rate cuts. So now we've had back-to-back -back rate cuts. Uh, we just cut 25 basis points last month. That's having a, an immediate impact on money market funds and pooled funds. And, you know, to the extent that we need liquidity for all your construction projects, you know, we do have a, a healthy balance in the overnight pools to meet the, uh, you know, the ever-changing liquidity needs here. But we've also extended the duration as we get to those portfolios. Right now, um, there's about five members of the, the Federal Reserve that think they, that no more rate cuts are needed, but the other seven are leaning towards an additional rate cut before the end of the year. So as you can kind of see, that's almost a 50-50 proposition there. And then once again, the Treasury yields have gone from last November, we were teetering around a 3% on a two-year Treasury yield. This morning as we speak, or this afternoon, the two-year Treasury yield is a 145. A 10-year Treasury yield is a 155. And uh, we we're still remain inverted from, from uh, you know, say a three-month T-bill down to a five-year yield. It, it declines down, and then it starts to finally raise back up between five and 10 years. So uh, again, dealing with an inverted yield curve kind of makes our job a little more challenging but we've still been able to find good opportunities uh, for Del Mar College and um, buying agency callables that give us good spreads over the treasury yields. Um, we've been utilizing commercial paper investments for our short-term needs, and we keep a, a nice ladder of uh, commercial paper for those maturities, you know, 90 to 180 days. As far as the portfolio currently, you can see that we still have, um, between the, the construction funds, there's two pretty large chunks here between the A and the B 2018. We've got about 5% remaining between 16 and 17 bond funds. And, uh, you know, the, the total composition there is about 67% uh, in bond funds, uh, or not quite, about 63% in construction funds with the remaining 37% being in the other funds, predominantly your general funds. This overview that we have right here is your pooled funds or your general funds. Um, I'd just like to kind of look at the far right column where we were last August. Um, the book value when we closed out August and market value was around 66 and a half million. The yield on the portfolio at that time was a 218 and the average yield of a six month T bill at that time was a 217. The interest earnings in that quarter uh, last year was 483,000. So as we skip forward, we can see our balance here highlighted in yellow. Uh, we finished this August with about $5 million more in total balance. We extended that weighted average maturity about uh, double from 54 days to 103 days. And the yield of the portfolios uh, was closing out at a 239 comparing to a, a six-month T-bill at a 206. Saw we had a nice spread over your treasury alternatives. And you can see that we earned about $90,000 more in August of 19 versus August of 18. The total earnings for the year uh, came in at about 2.1 million on your general funds. And then as we look at the breakdown, uh, comparing them in August of this year versus uh, the previous quarter, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of net change other than the fact that yields have been coming down, uh, as we've described. So in May to August, we saw that the average yield on the agencies in the portfolio went from a 255 to a 240. The pools dropped from a 255 to a 233, pretty consistent across the board. And then this um, bank CD is really insignificant. It's, uh, it's a very small check and account balance. Um, the commercial paper yield was a 275, dropped to a 270, and now that's way down following the treasuries. 
and um, the sweep funds, which are uh, a combination of your um, your pool rates, uh, you continue to see these kind of ratchet down. The non-general funds, uh, those two, the uh, bond funds that we talked about, the majority of those being centered around the 2018 A and B. Again, um, we've seen some spin down in those funds. In August of 2018, you had a market value of just under 155 million. Uh, we finished this August just over 121 million. Um, so net of interest earnings, we've spent at least 35 million of construction funds over the past year. Um, you can also see that the average yield on the portfolio last August was 217. We closed at a 246 there, which was a nice pickup over the Treasury benchmark comparison, about 40 basis points. We also had about double the amount of interest in August of 19 versus August of 18, about 380,000 there to 780,000 here this August. And the total earnings on the construction funds was almost three and a half million dollars. So um, to the extent that uh, we've partnered up with you guys, uh, we've remained proactive in trying to uh, determine your spending needs and trying to leverage the portfolio with those investments that kind of give you the maximum earnings potential. Um, but with safety and uh, liquidity always being highly emphasized. Um, that just about does it here. Um, again, just comparing how the allocations ended here uh, for the funds um, and the corresponding yields. So uh, it looks very similar to what we looked at for the general fund. So if there was any questions, I'd take them now. You, you didn't talk very much or mention anything about tariffs. How is that affecting our economy and particularly things like steel prices that we need in new construction? Yep. Well, it's definitely affecting, um, it's affecting a lot of different areas besides construction. You know, a lot of people are just kind of pulling in to monitor, you know, they're not stockpiling, obviously, or there was some stockpiling of certain commodities in anticipation of maybe, you know, having to spend up through the tariffs that, that uh, maybe we're going to be imposed or have been, you know, it's been this back and forth, right? Push and pull where we've taken tariffs off, we put them back on. Yeah. So there's just a lot of uncertainty. The bottom line is, um, you know, I think we still have solid footing here, but a lot of people are kind of maybe reducing their desire to spend, not knowing, you know, what it's going to look like until we've reached a final agreement. But, uh, you know, I look around here driving into town and um, clearly there's a boom going on here in yeah. the city of Corpus Christi. And uh, I think that's true of a lot of our port cities because, you know, being a consumer economy, there's a huge number of goods coming off these ships and, uh, you know, gas and oil that's got to get out of these pipelines and on the ships. So. Yeah. Yeah. Still going to be volatile, but uh, eventually I think uh, America is going to come out shining. <coughs> what would make it stabilize a little bit more, uh, changing? change in administration or <laughs> after well, 2020 or? you know I, I don't know that uh you know you still you know a lot of what's going on with china obviously has been you know china's kind of had their way with with uh the, it's been a little more one-sided as far as trade goes for them um it, you know there's a lot of things that don't necessarily show up where you know certain goods and services that they import over here are cloning a lot of U.S. technology, and they're kind of cutting <coughs> corners, and all that stuff is, you know, dollars leaving our economy and going back over there. So, and that's stuff that's really off the radar. So I think a lot of what's going on with these trade talks is trying to draw a little harder line in the sand, and, you know, you know as well as I do that, you know, uh, this, this thing could worsen, um, yeah. and it could get better. Yeah. I just really, d I think it, I think it hinges on, you know, I don't think the Chinese kind of think the same way that the Western world does. I think, you know, they still I think if he had the, the crystal ball and answer to that question, he probably wouldn't be standing in front yeah, of us. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, if I could just throw a big ball of money at it knowing that I, I, had, the, I had the answer. Um, but like I said, I think we're just trying to get to a point where uh, the, the, the guys who are really producing, you know, leading edge stuff here, uh, tech, you know, technological advances, that they're not being pirated and that ultimately the job creation that comes out of 
you know, these various uh, areas of strength in the U.S. economy, you know, that we've got to kind of safeguard that because I think a lot of, it, it, you know, we've been talking about y'all's trends and not just enrollment, but I think the trend in the future is uh, it's very technology oriented and the types of jobs that are going to be available for the kids coming out now, there's definitely a, a tech bias to them um, because of the amount of uh, advances going on there. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence, it's off the charts crazy what's going on. Quick, one question on yes. bank CDs. Is it is that rate correct, 0.2%? That What's that? On the bank CD rate, it says August, 0.2%. You know, that's not a uh, actual CD rate. That's like a, uh, those were like a checking demand account. Okay. I think it was just miscategorized in there. It's horrible. Those, yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's not where CD rates are. Okay. CD rates are more in line with treasury rates. That, that answers but that, it. But it was categorized incorrectly. That okay. was a um, checking account sweep, and that was on that. So, okay. good? Thank you. We're good? Yes. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good job. Uh, we need a motion to accept that investment report. Is there a motion to accept? Mr. Bennett makes the motion. Mr. Salinas seconds it. Any discussion on that motion? Is there any public comment on the motion to accept the college's quarterly investment report? Seeing no public comment, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion carries. Uh, now we're going to hear uh, have some discussion and possible action related to our 2020 internal audit plan and the 2019 internal audit report. Ms. McDonald. Yes, thank you. Dan, Dan Graves, a partner with Weaver, is here today to present our fiscal year 2020 internal audit plan and our fiscal year 2019 annual internal audit report. That annual internal audit report, we are required to submit that report to the state auditor's office by November 1st. So for your review and acceptance, I'll let, let Dan go ahead and review the plan. Good afternoon. I do have a very short presentation for you today compared to the other ones we've given. Um, <laughs> The 2019 internal audit report and as part of the 2019 internal audit report, the 2020 internal audit plan. Uh, just some quick refreshers and reminders. This is a report that we submit annually. The 2019 internal audit report is due by November 1st to the state auditor's office, the governor's office, budget and policy division, as well as the legislative budget board. And so it is a report over internal audit activity for the 2019 fiscal year and the format of the report is prescribed by the state auditor's office. They pr uh, provide new guidance every year about August 1st. And based on that guidance, uh, you'll see the sections here in our presentation of what is required. The first section is a requirement with Texas Government Code 2102.015, which is the publishing of the annual internal audit report on uh, the, the entity's website. And so that has to be done by November 1st. Uh, or within 30 days of uh, the governing body's approval. Uh, the, it contains the internal audit plan for fiscal year 19 and the results of that plan. Also any consulting or non-audit services that are provided by the internal audit function. Uh, the external quality assurance review of the internal audit function and so you'll see our peer review port report for our firm uh, in that report as well. You'll see the 2020 fiscal year plan for internal audit. You'll also see any external audit services performed for the college and then a disclosure on um, the method that the college has for uh, reporting and reviewing suspected fraud, waste, and abuse. So those are the four, or sorry, those are the elements of the report. Um, with that, the one element that you haven't seen is our 2020 internal audit plan. And so as part of that, you've seen uh, each one of the reports as we finalize those for the 2019 uh, annual audit plan. The 2020 audit plan does have a large portion of uh, that report. And you'll see in that 2020 internal audit plan that we've reviewed and coordinated with management that there are uh, internal audit and consulting projects planned for 2020. One of those is over grants management. There's also a special projects uh, area that we can provide special projects and special audits uh, as requested and coordinated with management. 
Then we also have uh, several internal audit follow-ups. Two of those for student services and grant management are the follow-ups over the internal audit findings from our 2019 plan. And then you'll see we have a few other uh, audits, about six that are from prior years where there's uh, one to anywhere between one and four items from those audits that need to be followed up on from prior findings. So that is my presentation. I don't have a whole lot because of, of those two items. This is a, a housekeeping uh, report that is, you know, as Tammy said, required by the Texas Internal Audit Act. And um, with approval, we can then submit that to the governing agencies and the oversight agencies and then provide that to the college to post on the website. Do we have any questions over the, the content of the report or the 2020 plan? Question about the special projects. Yes. Who would request that? Uh, that would be requested through college management. Uh, so if the board had anything that needed to be looked at, that would go through Dr. Escamilla and then to us for a special project based on the available budget for uh, the internal audit plan. Who do the internal auditors report to? We, by our charter, report to the board through Dr. Escamilla, according to the internal audit charter. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? We do need an action to adopt the uh, 2019 internal audit report, including the 2020 internal audit plan. Is there a motion to make, Ms. Hutchison makes that motion, Ms. Estrada makes a second. Any other comments or questions from Regents? Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion carries. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garcia is going to come back and give us our quarterly financial report. Okay, minor technical difficulties there, but I think we're there. <laughs> All right, Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the Board of Regents, we're going to first talk about uh, the revenues category, which is all these different components right here. In general, total revenues are within the planned budget. Miscellaneous revenue came in better than expected uh, relative to the planned budget due to improved yields uh, on our investments, as presented by our earlier uh, special guest. Uh, the tuition and fee revenues also came in better than expected than uh, relative to the planned budget due to increased enrollment in our continuing education and corporate contract uh, services. Moving on to expenditures, this category right here. In general, total expenditures is below the planned budget, mainly driven by salary and benefit costs. Uh, the next item is the unspent contingency of 1.9 million. Uh, for a total of 6.4 uh, net income for the uh, period ending August 31st. Uh, just keep in mind that we still are in audit mode. Uh, the audit has not been completed, so uh, there may be some adjustment moving forward, but more to come uh, once we conclude the audit process. Let's move on to the balance sheet. Okay. On the balance sheet, uh, let's talk about uh, cash. Cash is king, I always say. Uh, from our bondholders and creditors' perspective, the college, uh, the college's balance is stronger, uh, balance sheet is stronger from the 12 months ago. This is mainly attributed to the change in cash and investments of about seven million dollars, and then also for the fund balance, a uh, total of 6.4 million, which is right here. The increase in our accounts payable right here is attributed to the increase in year and expenditures that includes capital equipment for our workforce and continuing education programs. I also want to add specifically uh, on, on our overall uh, revenue bonds. Uh, the increase, I'm sorry, uh, I spoke to Dave Gordon about two or three weeks ago. Dave Gordon from Estrada Hinojosa and company. He described our bonds as investment grade uh, due to its high ratings of AA2 uh, from Moody's and AA2 uh, plus, uh, AA plus from Fitch. 
So it's, it's high ranking, you know, credit wording that says a lot about how we manage our financial statement and the strength of our balance sheet as well. Um, Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Are there questions or comments from Mr. Garcia? Mr. One, Bennett? one question. Yes, sir. Equipment expenditure, $4.8 million. Budget, $1.776. How'd that happen? How that happened? So uh, we have some uh, great things are happening at the college. This whole capital campaign that we're doing, uh, the workforce being one of them. Uh, we did buy some some uh, major equipment, and Lenora, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you to talk about some of the wonderful equipment that we purchased at year end, and how that's gonna make our program a little bit more robust and more marketable, or make our students' skill sets a little bit more marketable. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, some of this has been carried over, and it's a timing piece, in that uh, a lot of this has gone into a variety of programs. I think Chuck McKinney, Chuck, Chuck's not here, and a lot of this came out from under his division, actually, uh, that where they were able to go in and purchase some things that were needed, uh, that were aged out, and they've identified quite a few things, some in millwright, welding, uh, different products. Uh, we've been very fortunate and received right at $5 million approximately in uh, gifts, donations that are buying other equipment that's going into the Workforce Development Center. So you're seeing things gear up for these new buildings, for the Emerging Technology Building and the Workforce Development Center. Also, there's been some replacement in a variety of programs across campus. So it's identified need of obsolescent equipment and then also new opportunities that are needed. So, so it's all instructional equipment. Again, just trying to make sure that we have the appropriate equipment to properly train our students and make them ready um, uh, uh, for the workforce. Follow-up question? Yeah, we transferred some money out of the plant fund and bought equipment through the 2014 bond fund. I thought that was about $6 million. This I'm sorry, is, did we buy some? I, I don't recall that. Remember, we transferred it out of the plant fund we designated some uh, about five million dollars for ERP is that what you're talking about I'm not sure yeah it was for the ERP not this type um, of um, yeah. but not but not out of the 14 bond no 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 not out of the 14 bond what you're okay this is what you and I were chatting about the other yes. day I think okay okay so no um, what happened was um, out of the plant fund no okay so it's the ERP and the 14 bond. And what, what happened was we had plant fund dollars originally designated for FF&E. Um, and then when the 14 bonds came in way under as they did, we asked the board to use those dollars to buy the FF&E because of those low prices on the 14 bond to free up those dollars and the plant fund for the FF&E. For the ERP, for the ERP. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm getting all my acronyms yeah. missed up. Yeah. For the yeah. new com new yeah. software system, new computer, yeah. mainframe system. Yeah, so we freed up the plant fund for the ERP, and that's what that's what it's being paid out of. Okay, so that's totally unrelated to this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, in these dollars, what we knew going into the budget year, the requests going into this budget year were uh, lean, at best, the budgets, we, we, everybody was asking for equipment on the front end and so forth, and we were just kind of holding on tight, and, and I told everybody, I said, wait till mid-year, wait till mid-year, and then we would go and sweep other accounts if we could individually. I mean, it was a project-by-project project basis. Um, and, and then I said, ask, I said, let's get through, let's get through the base year, fund all the instruction first, and then if need be, we would go and pick and, 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 uh, and bolster up those equipment accounts to buy the necessary equipment. There were several areas of, of equipment, science and, and industrial equipment, um, that we, we picked out individually. But I had everybody um, on that front end, they were asking for all that money on the front end. I said, no, wait until we see what's not expended in various accounts for that particular year, and then we would fund it that way. 
are we unrelated to this? Are we going to get a detailed analysis on that 2014 bond fund? So you've asked me for that. Um, I I've got the note in to August right now. I've not gotten. Have you? Are y'all talking? So we're not. We're we're, we're coordinating that that um, um, detailed um, analysis that you're looking for. Okay, and this is the well, year-end statement, is it not? So this is for the 12 months ending August 31st. As I mentioned before, we're still in audit mode, and that <clears throat> process will not be completed. I'm estimating around the November, December time frame, we're coming in and probably delivering the, the final audit product. When, when do you get your unfunded pension liability entry? So we're still waiting on that number. We, we, we had some uh, preliminary numbers, and was, that's still being vetted out um, at the state level. But last year we came in at about 1.9 million in expenses, if that helps. It does. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Garcia, I have a question yeah. for you. Yeah. My questions are not as complicated as Mr. Bennett's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Mine you. Mine are very simple. <laughs> no, I uh, needed to ask you, give me an example of non-faculty stipends. I'll give you examples. Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I can do that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Non-faculty stipends is easily sometimes in the particularly in the corporate services area or the continuing education area. Those are not classified as faculty. They are instructional though, and they receive stipends for doing additional work such as you know, it could be product development, uh, could be a variety of things where they're doing additional work. And so okay. it's a stipend. It's a pay that's above and beyond their normal pay. It's a compensation incentive for the added. Uh, work okay thank you I have another one uh, I think it's page eight you have a check listed for six hundred eighteen dollars and seventy five cents made out to Jason's deli and it says it's for office supplies <laughs> instructional supplies office supplies uh, very good question oh my god <laughs> uh, so uh, what what that is 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 a grant funded expenditure and what we uh, we, we had a tax uh, educational program that was rolled out and participants were served uh, a lunch uh, as part of their fee and so unfortunately this is a uh, we, we, we recently found out that that was an error and we need to reclassify it as probably travel and expenses so uh, I think that uh, as of the end of the business business days that should be reclassified <coughs> to the appropriate uh, category okay and one final question uh Checks that are not made out to anybody. Yes, yep. so uh, those checks, uh, we, we, we intentionally not disclose that to keep for confidentiality purpose. These are payments for, uh, to students and, uh, and to employees. You know, this is the kind of thing that I would look just to figure out what, how my daughter is, 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 whether or not my daughter is getting a refund. You know, so uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to assess that because it's, the information is not there, you know. That's what it is. It's just confidential information. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Is there a motion to accept the college's quarterly financial report? Move to accept, Madam Chair. Mr. Rubis makes the motion to accept. Mr. Bennett seconds. Any discussion? Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Garcia. Ms. McDonald and Dr. Beth Lewis, discussion possible action related to B policy revisions um, and a notification of A procedural revisions. Yes, thank you. This particular um, section is going to have several moving parts. A lot of the policy revisions do fall under Dr. Lewis's area, but there are some other exec team members that will also, if you have questions, may participate if you have any questions on policy changes. So um, as we've talked about before, this is a continued work through our SACS reaffirmation to better clarify and align our policies with SACS COC standards. Um, when we do submit our report, then that report will include documents such as policies as evidence that will support the SACS COC report. So the, there are revisions to um, B4.1.1 cash reserves. I'm going to go ahead and let um, Mr. Garcia, if you have any questions, because I think it's up first on the list as a policy revision, if you have any questions on that, and then we'll move into Dr. Lewis's 
there's quite a few in chapter six faculty, which, which Dr. Lewis will cover for you. So B4.1.1 cash reserves, that policy should be the first policy revision right after the- Page 190, any questions on the, the cash yeah, it's reserves? It's cash reserves, we're changing it from, instead of fund balance, we're changing the title to cash reserves. And then um, changing unrestricted cash reserve in place of operating fund balance level. So like I said, if you have any questions for that, Dr. Garcia can answer those for you. I don't see any questions. That'd Thank be you. Mr. Garcia, I have not I'm sorry. that title. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. I just yeah. yeah. Thank you. We can continue. Thank you. Okay. And you also see on the tracking form that the policies have gone through our governance process and sub were submitted through councils and requested input. So you do see that also on your tracking form. So I'm going to go ahead and turn Chapter 6 over to Dr. Lewis so that she can go through the um, policy revisions. Let me understand. The, these changes are mainly to satisfy SACs? Yes, many of them are, either because uh, SAC COC has said you now must have a policy that addresses this, or quite frankly, it's been a while since we've looked at some of our policies and the language is no longer appropriate. Okay. Because of the things we're looking at for SACs, we're, up, we're bringing it up to speed. SACs is very prescriptive, um, and I think more than ever before um, in my experience, and so we're we're meeting things to prepare for that 10-year submission that'll be submitted in March of next year. Yes. Okay. okay. So um, all of the B6s at the top are simply defining terms and clarifying. We used to say um, teachers, counselors, or librarians, and all of that has been changed to faculty. We no longer have counselor faculty. Um, and our librarians are still considered faculty, but it's easier to do one group term of faculty. And then the definition of ranked and unranked. On B63, the fundamental responsibilities as listed there. And stop me if you have any questions, otherwise I'm just gonna plow through this fairly quickly. Um, flipping over to um, B6.5.5.1.1. Uh, the uh, evaluation of adjunct faculty. We did not have a requirement for adjunct faculty. Um, some of the departments chose to do it, but there was nothing in our policy manual that required us to evaluate adjunct faculty. SAC COC says now, yes, you have to have a policy and you have to evaluate your adjunct faculty. And so the process is outlined there. there's anything else that is very large one of the questions and I'm going to jump over to under B 6.18 on faculty recruitment you can wait till we can catch up on a page sure paper. I'm so sorry that's all right <laughs> I see this in my dreams I see these words in my dreams now so yes ma'am excuse me you, you don't have to go back, but I, this thing is, this uh, surface is out of battery. But I have a note here that says that adjunct faculty, uh, if no observations are made, I think I heard you just say that you have to, that is required, but if no observations are made, they can use other criteria to evaluate. Faculty. An evaluation has to be made, not necessarily an observation. So if an online faculty member is teaching exclusively online, there's okay. nothing to observe. And so they would look at other mechanisms. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, and jumping over to B618 there on recruitment. I know this is an A policy, but in case anyone has any questions about it, I do wanna clarify under A618.1, one of the things that we clarified is that SAC COC used to be very specific and they would say that the minimum qualification that had to be met was a master's degree and 18 graduate hours in the teaching discipline. They no longer say that. They make it very clear that it is incumbent upon the institution to prove qualifications for faculty members. And so we don't wanna be locked into something, one, that's no longer valid 
ballot, and two, that doesn't give us the flexibility. So what we have added is we've, we've altered the, the language a little bit to say uh, the criteria of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, which is usually a master's degree with 18 graduate semester hours in the teaching field or a master's degree with a major in the teaching field. However, however, other types of qualifications may prove to be appropriate as verified and documented. Okay, so just in case you're wondering what in the world would that be, uh, the example I always give when I'm doing training on this is that if John Grisham uh, retired to Port Aransas and wanted to teach English for us, <laughs> Under the old standards, he wouldn't be eligible to do that because he doesn't have a master's degree in English. But I think we could all argue that John Gresham probably knows what he's doing when he's teaching writing. <laughs> so that would allow us to hire someone who had extraordinary skills and accomplishments in the field but didn't necessarily have the master's degree. And we have examples that are not quite John Grisham right. locally. And we have faculty that teach in other areas. Um, because of expertise demonstrated and so forth. It is finally Sachs is getting and documenting this, this flexibility that has been their intention for decades, right. but finally they're giving us the capacity. Again, it's the onus is on us. Yes, and it is meant to be used fairly rarely. It's not something that is a, is a go-to. Um, we always want to have, it, as much as possible, we want to have the academic preparation. But if someone has extraordinary preparation and skills and not the degree, we could certainly make a case for that person. And I believe that that is, um, yes, I think that that is all we have on the B policies regarding faculty, with the exception of the last one, and this is a new policy. Um, B7.29.4, and this is one of those that this has always been Sachs's position, uh, and we've always done this, but we've never had a policy on it, which um, is sort of surprising. So, yeah, it's, yeah, B7, I'm sorry, B79.4, which simply states that any student graduating from Del Mar College has to earn at least 25% of their work at Del Mar College. So they would not be able to transfer everything in and get a degree from us. Questions? Any questions or comments related to these revisions? Seeing none, is there a motion to accept uh, the B policy revisions I, I think we Ms. have McDonald two more. Has, oh, I'm there's, so there's, sorry. I'm sorry. No. There's two more that actually are in Dr. Silva's area for student services for review, B7 policies. Hold that motion, Dr. Adami. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> Just in case there were questions on those Absolutely, two Absolutely, please. I'm so Excuse sorry. Excuse me. That's okay. But any, any questions for what Dr. Lewis presented? Then, that, then we'll move to Just Dr. one question. Silva. On the, the student evaluations, who gets to see those? So certainly the faculty member, their chair, and then when that faculty member goes up for promotion or for tenure, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately I see them also. Okay. The dean also sees them, their dean. So all the way up the, the chain. But not the students. The, the students do not at this point get to see the student evaluations of that faculty member. Um, that is something that as we transition to the new ERP, we want to make sure that we have a mechanism in place for that, but it is a fairly complex and complicated process for us to do right now, knowing that our ERP right now, whatever we built, would be going away. So we want to make sure that we have some sort of mechanism for that in the future, and we're working on that. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Okay, thank you. We'll go back to the um, section that's B7.12. It's the student complaint policy. Vince has taken us back to that page. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through the, the B, B parts. Under B7.12, the student complaint policy, there's a paragraph that is added um, to the board section, which there will be no retaliation, interference, or harassment toward any party to a complaint. Um, should a complainant or a witness experience any reprisal or retaliation, then it tells them who and how they should report it. So that is in addition to the B section. There are some um, changes to the A procedures, and it's bit to better um, 
we were trying to be consistent. Some policies from from years ago, we might have had work day. Um, it could say calendar day. So we're all trying to move to business day. So as we go through the policies, we're changing changing the timelines to business days. So we changed this one from work day to business day and defined that. We also added a few more days. It had five working days. We changed to 15 business days. It was quite difficult on one of our processes to get something turned around in five days because of schedules and other things. So we, we gave a little more time for for some of the steps to have a little bit more time to respond. That's in one of the A sections. And a lot of the, the A procedures reflect um, what we're currently doing is just to add a, a, a little bit more information so that people will understand a little bit better what that process entails. And so if you if you look at the A sections, those are pretty much what, what those changes are, is to go ahead and put in place what the current practices are. And I believe that's all of the, for, for that particular policy would be 7.12. That's all of the, um, the first paragraph was all of the B changes. The rest are the A pro procedure changes. So if you have any questions, I can answer those or Dr. Silva can help answer the questions for that policy. The 15 days, is that gonna be consistent for all the complaints now? No, it, it, we look at the type of the complaint and we also look at how many steps and who all of, could be involved. So it just depends on the type of the complaint, um, who's involved, where does it have to go, and um, so we look at that. So we don't have one set time period for any complaint. You have five days or 10 days. We look at the type of complaint and who's involved. When I read through the, the policy manual, it's confusing to me, and I'm not subjected to it. So I'm wondering how the faculty knows what, what the time frame is. Well, now this is this is the on the student complaint section, but they go to the policy and it, and it will tell them, and, and they're notified if anyone's involved in the process that this particular process is in place, and they get a copy of the policy saying this is the policy we're going to follow. So if they go to the step, it says you have five business days or ten business days or fifteen business days from the date of complaint or the date of receipt. So it's in policy, whatever policy they're. Um, have filed something other or they are given to follow. It's in, they, they follow the policy that they're under. Okay, so what are the consequences if they miss the deadline? Well, it just depends on what type of, of policy or complaint that it is. Some of them could be if you miss a deadline, then all action stops. Some of it could be if you miss a deadline, it could skip to the next step. So, you know, there's so many different processes that we have in place and all different policies, not just student, but also employee processes. It's all spelled out in policy, though. It tells you if you miss a deadline, then this is what will happen. So and it if administration misses a deadline, what are the consequences then? It's spelled out in policy. And remember, these are administrative processes. They are not legal deadlines as far as you have to file something with the court by a certain day. Um, there are administrative steps. There could be extenuating circumstances. You know, we've had quite a few extenuating circumstances that have that have happened if a particular step has to be extended. Doesn't mean you've, you've missed a deadline. It could be an extension that's requested for any type, and, and usually both parties can request, um, any, any party to a complaint can request an extension of time due to certain circumstances. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Any other catch-all questions? Anybody else to present? One more. We have one more policy. It's B7.13. It's standards of student conduct. And there are, I think it goes down to the third page. There are a few sections that were added under the B sections. Um, so like I said, this is about student conduct. And we added failure to comply with established Delmar College Board policies and our administrative procedures. So that's one of the reasons that you could fall under student conduct. We if you don't follow policy or procedures, you could be subject to, to discipline or under student conduct. Also under admonishment, we just kind of just added some, some clarity. Um, you can be admonished with or without education, with or without educational counseling sessions specific to the breach of the conduct. We just added a little bit more clarification, like I said, on the practices that we're doing or that the student service office is doing. They just wanted to make sure it was a little, little more spelt out and a little clearer on what they were actually, um, the process that they were following. 
And then on uh, loss of privileges, they kind of wanted to spell out a few of those examples of loss of privileges if a student was under a particular um, conduct issue. So they added four specific loss of privileges examples. Um, we also added additional sanctions may be imposed as warranted. So maybe these aren't all the sanctions because you can't name everything. So you also want to make sure that you can oppose others if it's warranted. So that's a B section. Um, and again, we, we changed calendar days to business days, trying to be consistent with the business day um, language. And under another process, um, they just wanted to make sure that they added some clarity on if a student is within a discipline process that part of that procedure could they have a representative or not and what role would that representative play in that particular hearing or procedure and it's the practice of their they've been conducting is just we wanted to make sure it was a little more clear in in the policy and those are a sections so i think that that covers that particular um, policy for standards of student conduct policy okay that is it yes ma'am thank you <laughs> <laughs> she keeps on rolling them out there she <laughs> <laughs> dr adami made a motion to accept earlier is your motion still valid sir uh can it be yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'll second it so motion by dr adami a second by mr revis are there any other board comments or questions about these policy revisions is there any public comment related to these policy revisions? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jim Klein. I teach in the Social Sciences Department. Um, uh, regarding the evaluation of adjunct instructors, I think that, that this is, is really long overdue uh, at the college. I would just add, though, that I think that, especially in the larger departments like social sciences or English and philosophy, that that adding this now is going to dramatically increase the workload for department chairs, uh, especially in those larger departments, uh, and I think that there should be some consideration given to additional compensation for that additional workload. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else for public comment? Seeing none, uh, there's a motion on the table. All those in favor of these policy revisions, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. That motion carries. Um, thank you all very much. We are now going to go to general public comment. Do we have? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jack Gordy. Yes, I'm Jack Gordy, and I live at 4118 Bray. And I'm here to talk about something that happened April the 10th. 45 minutes before the Board of Regents meeting. 45 minutes before, okay? There was a staff member sitting there by himself. Nobody was talking to him. He was by himself, and I walked over and started talking to him. I was not harassing anyone. I wasn't causing any kind of trouble, and I wasn't interfering with anything. And what does the president do? come walking over where I was at, and he said, you can't talk to the staff. If you got anything to say, wait to public comment. Now, I could understand it if I was causing some kind of a problem, but I wasn't. And when I got ready to leave, you people went into closed session, and I walked outside, and a staff member motioned for me to come over where he was at, and I walked over and started talking to him. And here comes the police officer reporting the same thing that the president said. You can't talk to the staff. If you've got anything to say, you should have said it during public comment. That's a bunch of nonsense. That's interfering with public speech, private speech. I wasn't interfering with anybody. Like I said, I didn't arrest anybody. I didn't cause any trouble, and I didn't, call, I didn't interfere with anything. I'd like for somebody, I don't care who, to tell me why people can't talk to the staff. Now, I could understand it, like I said, if it was interrupting something, but when it's not, that don't even make any sense. Somebody needs to send him back to training and let him know what the policy. He sent me a copy of the policy, and the policy says if you're not, you can't interfere with anything, 
you can't cause an harassment and you can't cause a problem. And I wasn't doing any of that. So it don't make no sense at all. Somebody needs to talk to the president and get him straightened out. Thank you, Mr. Gordy. Mr. Klein, did you want to speak again in general public comment? Thank you for your time. Again, my name is Jim Klein. Uh, I'm with the local chapter here, the American Association of University Professors. Uh, and I just want to take a moment to introduce you to Professor Kezia Streit Ruiz, uh, who is the new incoming president of the local chapter of the AAUP. I just want to say that I have every confidence that Kezia will uphold the professional standards of the AAUP uh, that have become the norm in higher education throughout the United States over the past century, particularly as they pertain to academic freedom, the idea that the classroom instructor or researcher should pursue their work without influence from others, and shared governance, uh, the idea that the faculty should join the administration and governing board in creating a tripod of leadership uh, at the college or university. I'll continue to work with the AEP in support of Kesha's in initiatives in these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ruiz, you've also signed up to speak. Would you like to say a few words? No, just hello and looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else for general public comment? If not, then the board will enter into a closed session under Texas Government Code 551.071 regarding pending or contemplated litigation or a settlement offer with possible discussion and action in open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel on pending legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session. Also under Texas Government Code 551.072 regarding the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property with a possible discussion and action in open session and under Texas Government Code 551.073 regarding the deliberation of a prospective gift or donation with possible discussion or action in open session. The time is 3.10 p.m. We'll take a five-minute recess. session at 3.33 p.m. There is no action uh, coming out of closed session. Next item on our agenda is uh, calendaring. Uh, we have our association of trustees. I am so sorry. We are back from closed session at 3.33 p.m. There's no action coming out of closed session. Next item on our agenda is calendaring. Uh, we have our Association of Community College Trustees conference next week. Uh, the week following is Over the Edge. Uh, you all still have a few days to contribute to your favorite board chair who's going over the edge on your behalf. And if you don't contribute, you can go with me. Um, <laughs> in November, our board date will be November 12th. Uh, and the following day is a scholarship reception to which you are all invited, uh, recognizing scholarship students, and then the coordinating board leadership conference in Austin, uh, November 21st and 22nd. Board day in December will be on the 10th with fall graduation on the 13th. Anything else for our calendar? If, you, if something comes up between time, you can always let uh, Ms. Pettis know or Ms. Villarreal know and, and we'll be happy to add that to our calendar. With no other business, our meeting is adjourned at 3.34 p.m.